Selected Works of Mao Zedong, Volume 2, Audiobook, Part 28. Unite all anti-Japanese forces and combat the anti-communist diehards. Comrade Mao Zedong delivered this speech at a mass rally in Yan'an to denounce Wang Qingwei, February 1, 1940. Why are we, the people of all circles in Yan'an, meeting here today? We are here to denounce the traitor Wang Qingwei. We are here to unite all anti-Japanese forces and to combat the anti-communist diehards. Time and again, we communists have pointed out that Japanese imperialism is set in its policy of subjugating China. Whatever cabinet changes there may be in Japan, she will not change her basic policy of subjugating China and reducing it to a colony. Frightened out of his wits by this fact, Wang Qingwei, the political representative of the pro-Japanese faction of the Chinese big bourgeoisie, grovels before Japan and concludes a traitorous pact, betraying China to Japanese imperialism. Moreover, he wants to set up a puppet government and army in opposition to the anti-Japanese government and army. Of late, he has hardly mentioned opposition to Chiang Kai-shek and is said to have shifted over to alliance with Chiang. Anti-communism is the main objective both of Japan and of Wang Qingwei. Knowing that the Communist Party is the most resolute in fighting Japan, and that Kuomintang Communist cooperation means greater strength for resistance, they are trying their hardest to break up this cooperation and to separate the two parties, or better still, to set them to fighting each other. Hence they have used the diehards within the Kuomintang to create trouble everywhere. In Hunan, there was the Pingqiang Massacre. In Honan, the Chueshan Massacre. In Shanxi, the Old Army attacked the New Army. In Hopei, Chang Yin Wu attacked the Eighth Route Army. In Shantung, Qin Chi Jung attacked the guerrillas. In Eastern Hupei, Cheng Ju Huai killed between five and six hundred communists. And as for the Shenxi Kansu Ningxia border region, the diehards are trying to set up a spy network from within and enforce a blockade from without, and are preparing an armed attack. In addition, they have arrested a large number of progressive young people and put them in concentration camps. They have hired that metaphysics monger Chang Chun Mai to make reactionary proposals for the liquidation of the Communist Party, the abolition of the Shenzi Kansu Ningxia border region, and the disbandment of the Eighth Route and New Fourth Armies and they have hired the Trotskyite Ye Ching and others to write articles abusing the Communist Party. All this has one purpose only, to disrupt resistance to Japan and turn the Chinese people into colonial slaves. Footnotes. For the Pingqiang Massacre, see the reactionaries must be punished. Note 1, page 260 of this volume. The Chueshan Massacre occurred on November 11, 1939, when more than 1,800 Kuomintang secret agents and soldiers attacked the liaison offices of the new 4th Army in the town of Chuku, Chueshan County, Honan. Over 200 people were murdered, including new 4th Army officers and soldiers who had been wounded in the anti-Japanese war and members of their families. The old army refers to the troops under Yen Shishan, the Kuomintang warlord in Shanxi. The new army, known as the Anti-Japanese Dare to Die Corps, was the People's Anti-Japanese Army of Shanxi, which grew up under the influence and leadership of the Communist Party. In December 1939, Chiang Kai-shek and Yen Xishan concentrated six army corps in western Shanxi to attack the corps, but met with a smashing defeat. At the same time, Yen's troops in southeastern Shanxi attacked the anti-Japanese democratic county governments and mass organizations in the Yangcheng Chincheng area, and murdered a great number of communists and progressives. Chang Yin Wu, commander of the Peace Preservation Corps of the Kuomintang Brigands in Hopei, sprang a surprise attack on the liaison offices of the 8th Route Army in Shenzian County, Hopei, in June 1939, and slaughtered more than 400 of its cadres and soldiers. In April 1939, on the instructions of Shen Hung Lie, the Kuomintang governor of Shantung, 
Qin Chi Zhong's bandit troops attacked the 3rd Guerrilla Detachment of the Shantung Column of the 8th Root Army at Potion, killing 400 men, including regimental officers. In September 1939, Cheng Zhu Huai, a Kuomintang military commander in eastern Hupei, attacked the liaison offices of the new 4th Army and killed between 5 and 600 communists. From the winter of 1939 to the spring of 1940, the Kuomintang troops seized the county towns of Chunhua, Sunyi, Chengning, Ningxian, and Chenyuan in the Shensikansu Ningxia border region. Imitating the German and Italian fascists, the Kuomintang reactionaries established during the anti Japanese war many concentration camps which extended from Lanchao and Xi'an in the northwest to Kanchao and Shangjiao in the southeast. Large numbers of communists, patriots, and progressive youth were interned in them. After the fall of Wuhan in October 1938, the Kuomintang intensified its anti-communist activities. In February 1939, Chiang Kai-shek secretly issued such documents as Measures for Dealing with the Communist Problem and Measures for Guarding Against Communist Activities in the Japanese-Occupied Areas, and stepped up his political repression of the Communist Party in the Kuomintang-controlled areas and his military attacks on it in central and northern China. The culmination was the first large-scale anti-communist onslaught of December 1939 through March 1940. End of footnotes. Thus the Wang Qingwei clique and the anti-communist diehards in the Kuomintang have been working in collusion, one from without and the other from within, have created pandemonium. This state of affairs has infuriated large numbers of people who think that the resistance to Japan is now finished and done for, and that the members of the Kuomintang are all scoundrels who ought to be opposed. We must say that their fury is entirely justified, for how can anybody help becoming infuriated in the face of such a grave situation? But resistance to Japan is not finished and done for, nor are all Kuomintang members scoundrels. Different policies should be adopted towards the different sections of the Kuomintang. Those conscienceless scoundrels who had the audacity to stab the Eighth Root and New Fourth Armies in the back, to perpetrate the massacres at Pingkyang and Chueshan, to disrupt the border region and to attack progressive armies and organizations and progressive individuals, these scoundrels must not be tolerated, but must be dealt counterblows. Any concession to them is out of the question, for they are so utterly devoid of conscience that they are even creating friction and perpetrating massacres and splits after our national enemy has penetrated deep into our territory. Whatever they may think, they are actually helping Japan and Wang Qingwei, and some of them have been undercover traitors from the very outset. Failure to punish them would be a mistake. It would be an encouragement to the collaborators and traitors. It would be disloyalty to the national resistance and to our motherland, and an invitation to the scoundrels to disrupt the united front. It would be a violation of the policy of our party. However, the sole purpose of the policy of dealing blows to the capitulators and the anti-communist diehards is to keep up the resistance to Japan and safeguard the anti-Japanese united front. Therefore, we should show goodwill towards those Kuomintang members who are not capitulators or anti-communist diehards but are loyal to the war of resistance. We should unite with them, respect them, and be willing to continue our long-term cooperation with them so as to put our country in order. Whoever does otherwise is also violating the policy of the party. The policy of our party is twofold. On the one hand, to unite all the progressive forces and all people loyal to the cause of resisting Japan. And on the other, to oppose all the heartless scoundrels, the capitulators, and the anti-communist diehards. Both these aspects of our policy have a single objective, to bring about a turn for the better and defeat Japan. The task of the Communist Party and the people all over the country is to unite all the forces of resistance and progress, to combat all the forces of capitulation and retrogression, and to work hard to stop the present deterioration and change the situation for the better. This is our basic policy. We are optimistic. 
we shall never become pessimistic or despairing. We are not afraid of any attacks by the capitulators or the anti-communist diehards. We must smash them, and we certainly shall. China will surely achieve national liberation. China will never perish. China will surely achieve progress. The present retrogression is only a temporary phenomenon. In our meeting today, we also want to make it clear to the people throughout the country that the unity and progress of the whole nation are essential to the war of resistance. Some people emphasize resistance alone and are reluctant to emphasize unity and progress, or even fail to mention them. This is wrong. How can the war of resistance be maintained without genuine and firm unity, without rapid and solid progress? The anti-communist diehards within the Kuomintang emphasize unification, but their so-called unification is not genuine, but a sham, not a rational, but an irrational unification, not a unification in substance, but in form. They howl for unification, but what they really want is to liquidate the Communist Party, the Eighth Route and New Fourth Armies, and the Shensi Kansu Ningxia border region, on the pretext that China cannot be unified so long as these exist. They want to turn everything over to the Kuomintang, and not merely to continue, but to extend their one party dictatorship. If this were to occur, what unification could there be? Truth to tell, if the Communist Party, the Eighth Route and New Fourth Armies, and the Shensi Kansu Ningxia border region had not stepped forth and sincerely advocated ending the civil war and uniting for resistance to Japan, there would have been nobody to initiate the anti-Japanese National United Front or to take the lead in the peaceful settlement of the Xi'an incident, and there would have been no possibility at all of resisting Japan. And if today the Communist Party, the Eighth Route and New Fourth Armies, the Shensi Kansu Ningxia border region, and the anti-Japanese democratic base areas did not step forth and sincerely sustain the resistance to Japan, and combat the dangerous tendencies towards capitulation, a split and retrogression, the situation would indeed be in a terrible mess. The several hundred thousand troops of the Eighth Route and New Fourth Armies are holding two-fifths of the enemy forces in check by engaging 17 out of the 40 Japanese divisions. Why should these armies be disbanded? Footnote. The 8th Route and New 4th Armies later engaged an even larger number of Japanese troops. By 1943, they were fighting 64 pet cent of Japan's forces of aggression and 95% of the puppet troops. And a footnote. The Shensi Kansu Ningxia border region is the most progressive region in the country. It is a democratic anti Japanese base area. Here there are, first, no corrupt officials. Second, no local tyrants and evil gentry. Third, no gambling. Fourth, no prostitutes. Fifth, no concubines. Sixth, no beggars. Seventh, no narrow self-seeking cliques. Eighth, no atmosphere of dejection and laxity. Ninth, no professional friction mongers. And tenth, no war profiteers. Why then should the border region be abolished? Only people without any sense of shame dare suggest anything so shameful. What right have these diehards to breathe a word against us? No, comrades. What needs to be done is not to abolish the border region, but to get the whole country to follow its example, not to disband the Eighth Route and New Fourth Armies, but to get the whole country to follow their example, not to liquidate the Communist Party, but to get the whole country to follow its example not to pull progressive people back to the level of backward people, but to get the latter to catch up with the former. We communists are the staunchest advocates of unification. It is we who have initiated and maintained the united front and who have put forward the slogan for a unified democratic republic. Who else could have proposed these things? Who else could have put them into effect? Who else could be content with a monthly allowance of only 5 yuan? Footnote. 5 yuan was the average monthly allowance for all men serving in the anti-Japanese armed forces and in the anti-Japanese government offices under communist leadership. End of footnote. 
who else could have formed such a clean and incorruptible government? There is unification and unification. The capitulators have their idea of unification. They want to unify us into capitulating. The anti-communist diehards have their idea of unification. They want to unify us into splitting and retrogression. Could we ever accept these ideas of theirs? Can any unification that is not based on resistance, unity, and progress be considered genuine or rational or real unification? What a pipe dream. It is to put forward our own idea of unification that we are meeting here today. Our idea of unification is identical with that of all the people of China, of every man and woman with a conscience. It is based on resistance, unity, and progress. Only through progress can we achieve unity. Only through unity can we resist Japan. And only through progress, unity, and resistance can the country be unified. This is our idea of unification, a genuine, rational, real unification. The idea of a sham, irrational, and formal unification is one which would lead to national subjugation and which is held by persons utterly devoid of conscience. These people want to destroy the Communist Party, the Eighth Route and New Fourth Armies, and the anti-Japanese democratic base areas, and wipe out all the local anti-Japanese forces in order to establish unification under the Kuomintang. This is a plot, an attempt to perpetuate autocratic rule under the guise of unification, to sell the dog meat of their one-party dictatorship under the label of the sheep's head of unification. It is a plot of brazen-faced braggarts who are lost to all sense of shame. We are meeting here today precisely to punch holes in this paper tiger of theirs. Let us relentlessly combat these anti-communist diehards. End of part 28.